this is Shaw Cable 10, your community access television channel, serving the West Kootenays with community-produced programming. If you have an event you would like covered, or you would like to become involved in the community channel, please contact our programming department at 1951 Avenue in Cassegar by calling 368-5501 or 365-3711. Cassegar Super Value has been serving the area for over 30 years and is proud to sponsor Kootenai Kitchen. Super Value, where your satisfaction is our main concern. Hi, and welcome to the first, and hopefully not the last, televised edition of Kootenai Kitchen. For those of you that aren't familiar with Kootenai Kitchen, I should possibly explain that Kootenai Kitchen began actually as Caribou Kitchen when I lived up in the Caribou area, where it was carried by two of the local newspapers up there. When I moved over to Creston, it suddenly became Kootenai Kitchen for obvious reasons, and then when I came to Castlegar, it continued to be Kootenai Kitchen. It's also seen in the, or in the Okanagan newspapers as OK Kitchen. I'd like to thank uh, Richard Howes and the Castlegar Super Value for sponsoring this televised version. So those of you that have followed the column, you'll get a chance to see what I look like and perhaps what some of my furry family looks like, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure some of you are curious about that. And this is where it all happens. And it actually looks pretty normal, doesn't it? We'll see if we can fix that over the next few shows. Today we're going to do some recipes for Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving holiday coming up the weekend after this approaching one. And Pumpkin pie has always been popular for Thanksgiving, so we're going to do a, a variation of a pumpkin pie, which is incredibly rich, incredibly fattening. And if you look at it, you'll probably put on five pounds, but we don't care about this time of year because we start wearing heavier clothing anyway. And then we're also going to do a reasonably calorie-wise vegetable dish, which helps uh, dress up a vegetable that's commonly seen under a cheese sauce. It's a little bit of a variation on how to cook cauliflower. So we'll start by putting a pie crust together. And the pumpkin pie that I'm going to make uses a ginger snap pie crust. Ginger snaps, of course, being a nice way to complement the pumpkin pie flavor. So we're starting with ginger snaps. These are a, a two inch ginger snap, just a common ginger snap. And you'll need 20 of them, which makes one and one third or one and two thirds cups of crumbs. And to do that, we have to crush them. And the easiest way to crush a ginger snap, let's get a bag out. Get a rolling pin out, and we'll count them out. We have five here. I find crushing them ten at a time works fairly well. That's five. That's five more. And further to that, I don't have to take my shoes off to use my toes that way. And then you think about all the guests that are coming, and you beat up your ginger snaps. Make your crumbs fairly fine, because this is a pie crust, and it has to fit in the pie shell. So you have a fairly smooth pie shell. So if you crush them pretty thoroughly and then finish off with a roll, assuming of course that your bag will hold still for you. A plastic bag works well for this. I find a paper bag quite often will uh, tear and what you'll have then are ginger snap crumbs all over your kitchen which is quite all right around here because with the furry population, nothing ever hits the floor anyway. So we'll put that there. And we'll measure out this portion of them. And then we'll go for 10 more. By breaking them in half like this and doing half at a time, it makes it a lot easier to get the fine crumbs that are necessary to make the crust that's easy to work with. This is basically the same principle as grain cracker crust. A 
Okay, so what we have here now are 20 ginger snaps, normal size ginger snap. Go to the store, buy a bag of ginger snaps. You'll have less leftover ginger snaps to eat later, which is always a plan too. And that 20 ginger snaps will equal, just as soon as I get them crushed, Good. Okay. Now we have about one and two thirds cups of ginger snaps in this cup here. Okay. Now we're going to put the ginger snaps into this bowl. So we have one and two third cups of ginger snap crumbs, which began as 20 ginger snaps. And we're going to add to that six tablespoons of melted butter or margarine, depending on what you're happy using. And while we're over here, we're going to turn the stove on to 375 degrees, because we're going to bake this crust for a few minutes. Okay, we add the melted butter to the ginger snaps. And then we're going to stir it up. You'll find that this is quite a moist mixture, which makes it easier to work with. And that's Bert you hear in the background. I don't know if you can see him, probably not. He's one of the furry creatures that live here. And he doesn't like ginger snaps, so we don't have to worry about him. And then we put that in a regular sized pie pan. Now the best way I found to put crumbs into a pie pan to make a crumb crust is just pour them all in there. Spread them out fairly evenly. Make a little bit of a depression in the center while you're doing it because that gives you your extra crumbs for the edges. And then start pressing down. Now I like to use your standard size dessert spoon or tablespoon, whatever you wish to call it for this. Because these will press down and as you press them down, of course, it's going to push more crumbs to the edges of the pan, which will help you make your crust in your rim. Try and even them out as best you can, although it's not really all that important. You'll find that cooking, although people go for, it's, it's not really all that exact. You can have a lot of leeway in a lot of recipes and not worry about it too awful much. Now, if you see what I'm doing here, I'm just kind of pushing like this, and that's smoothing out the edges, but I'm holding the crumbs here so they don't come off the top of the pan. Okay? And go all the way around the end. And try and make this fairly deep. So if you see that it's not quite deep enough, go around again. Push right at the edge here. Because there's a fair amount of filling that goes in here. Okay, and then you can smooth your top a little bit just to make it neat. Okay, once again, our crust has 20 crushed ginger snaps, or one and two-thirds cups of crumbs, six tablespoons of melted margarine, stir it, put it in the pan, make a crust out of it. Then we're going to put it in a 375 degree oven for about eight minutes. And that will make it reasonably crispy. And while we're waiting for that to bake, we're going to start the cauliflower recipe. Now the cauliflower recipe isn't really a lot of work because when you're working with cauliflower, you're boiling it anyway. And this is just a matter of boiling cauliflower in something other than water. And it's not being served with cheese sauce either, which is the normal way that you'd see cauliflower served. So we're gonna start with a pot and we're going to put in any vegetable oil will will do. I use olive oil because it's an Italian type of recipe. It's called cauliflower italiano. And I like to use the olive oil because I have it on hand. If you don't have olive oil on hand, you go right ahead and use any vegetable oil. So we're looking at three tablespoons of vegetable oil just in a pot that's going to hold your cauliflower. Now we're looking at one whole head of cauliflower. So a pot that'll hold a whole head of cauliflower. Vegetable oil in the pot. 
And then we're going to get a clove of garlic. This one wants to make baby garlics. And we're going to cut it up. You can mince it fairly finely. You can slice it. It all depends on how pronounced you want your garlic taste. So now we slice the garlic. And if you don't have fresh garlic on hand, I'll quite often just drop a little bit of garlic powder in a pot. If there is no fresh garlic in the kitchen, there's always garlic powder in my kitchen, so that's fine. So we'll slice that, and we'll put that in that pot. Now we're going to go over to the stove. We're going to saute the garlic just a touch. And we're probably not even going to watch that happen while the stove heats up, because I think it'll be fine by itself. Now to that pot, we're going to add a can of tomatoes. That's a 19 ounce can. 14 ounce can will do if that's what you have on hand. I know I have a can open here somewhere. Here we go. So we have garlic over there in olive oil. All we're doing is heating that garlic just a tiny bit to soften it up a little bit, if you would. OK, we've got a can of tomatoes here. Let's go over and see how things are doing over there. Yeah, that's fine. OK, now I'm going to turn this up, because we're going to put the tomatoes in here. So three tablespoons of oil, any kind of oil, olive if you have it. One clove of garlic minced, substitute garlic powder, in which case you don't need to saute the garlic. You can just throw the whole thing in the pot. We have either a 14 or a 19 ounce can of tomatoes. That one happens to be a 19. We're going to put those in there. We're going to break them up with a spoon here so that we have little tomato pieces instead of big tomato chunks. And we'll stir that in. And to that, we're going to add a half a teaspoon of salt. And I'm one of those people that do it like this. Like I said, it doesn't have to be that exact. And a quarter of a teaspoon of basil. And I like to do that with a dried herb. It releases a little more flavor if you give them a crush just before you use them. OK, now we're going to take this back to the stove. And we're going to bring it to a boil. And while that's heating up, we'll get the cauliflower out. Mm. Direct from Super Value's Fresh Produce section. And we'll feed our way into that. Hang on. This incredibly well wrapped crispy cauliflower. And we'll cut it. Now, how you cut your cauliflower is up to you. I like to leave it. Not in little chunks, but in fair-sized chunks. And cauliflower, of course, if you're growing it in your garden and you're worried about the bugs, you can just drop the head in a bowl of salted water for a while, which will dry the bugs out. And I found over the years of gardening that the odd little green worm that you miss, when you cook them, they turn brown, which makes them really easy to pick out. But in a tomato dish, they're hard to find. so. Try and get them out first. So I'm going to cut that up, oh, about that big. Now, a head of cauliflower, depending on what else you're serving for Thanksgiving dinner, and quite often Thanksgiving dinner comes with all the bells and whistles, will uh, probably make you six servings, eight if you stretch it, four if you're real pigs. OK, I can hear tomatoes boiling. So we're going to take all this cauliflower over there and hope it fits in this pan that I chose to use. And hope that I don't dump it all over the floor on the way over there. OK. So we'll put that in there. Aha, hit the stove. Good show. OK, now as I put this in there, the tomatoes, of course, are going to stop boiling because this is cold. And 
And if I treat it like a jigsaw puzzle, it's probably going to fit, too. Good plan. Okay. Now turn this down, because what you want to do is you want to simmer it. Basically, all you're doing is you're cooking cauliflower, which is what you were going to do anyway. So it's not going to take any more time, except that you're going to open a can and put that in the pot as opposed to pouring a little bit of water in the pot. And you're not going to have the problem of having to put a cheese sauce together afterwards. So we'll put that there. And cauliflower should take about 10 minutes. I'm one of those people who forgot to set the timer for the pie crust. Okay, fine. So we'll have a look and say, oh, hey, that needs three more minutes and set that up there. And back to the original subject, I am a person who likes cauliflower, as we Italians say, al dente, which is not really mushy. So about 10 minutes in the tomatoes, let it boil, way it goes. Okay, now let's clean up the counter a little bit. Let's get all this cauliflower stuff out of the way. Now in the pie crust, which we're going to go back to now, we're going to put a layer of butter pecan ice cream. Butter pecan ice cream. Two cups of butter pecan ice cream. And you can use the same measuring cup that we use for the ginger snaps, because of course it's not dirty. And we'll scoop that out. Now what you have to do with this, this was out of the freezer for a while, so it's, it's a little soft and a little bit easier to work with than it normally would be. So that's what you're going to have to remember. Take this out of the freezer a few minutes before you're ready to do this because you need it to be a little soft because you want to stir it and soften it even more so that it's spreadable because you don't want to rip your nice gingerbread crust that you spent all that time putting together not too long ago into little bitty shreds with the ice cream. So we'll put the ice cream in a bowl, mush it, stir it, beat on it, soften it any way you can, stick your finger in it. Lick your finger. It's one of the joys of cooking. Just make it fairly workable, I guess is what you want. So stir it and stir it and beat it. And there we go. That doesn't take too much. Okay. Now, we're going to assume that our crust is done because the timer stopped, which par for the course in this kitchen. So we have our ginger snap pie crust here. And something else I like to do with this when I get it out is just go at it with a spoon one more time because it's still fairly flexible at this point and you can push that up just a little bit around the edges to make it again deep. Now I'm going to put that one there to cool because you want to of course work with a cool ginger snap pie crust because you have cold ice cream over there that you don't want to turn into soup. So through the magic of pre-planning we have a gingerbread pie crust. Ginger snap pie crust, I'm sorry. And we're going to put this ice cream in here. And we're going to spread it in the bottom of the shell. Nice even layer. Let's see how easily that works once you beat it to death like that. No problem. Then we Lick a spoon. Excellent butter pecan ice cream. And we're going to put this in the fridge, or in the freezer again, just to firm up a bit while we prepare the pumpkin part of the filling. And we're going to finish licking the spoon. Okay, get rid of some of the crud. Now, the pumpkin part of the filling, start with a can of pumpkin. This is just plain mashed pumpkin. This is not pumpkin pie filling. There's no spices in this. There's nothing in this but, wait a minute, we'll get there, hang on. There's nothing in this but strained pumpkin and squash, which is a standard ingredient. In mashed pumpkin, it gives it more flavor. So what we want is one cup of this pumpkin. Measure that out. Put the pumpkin in a mixing bowl. Of course, mashed pumpkin is cooked pumpkin, so you don't have to worry about that. We're going to add to that one cup of sugar. Okay, and you'll notice I measured that. 
And we're going to add to that a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, which I'm going to measure like this because that's what I do. Close enough. And a quarter teaspoon of ginger, which is about that much. And a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg. All the basic pumpkin pie spices is what you're putting in here. And then we're going to add something that you sometimes see in a pumpkin pie and you sometimes don't, which is vanilla. Now, something I have noticed, measure your lids. This lid holds exactly one teaspoon, so you don't have to dirty a measuring spoon. So half a teaspoon is half a lid. Okay, now it's just a matter of stirring this. So we blend in the spices and we blend in the sugar. And then we go over to the fridge and we collect the whipped cream. If I can find it, there it is. Okay. In this bowl is one cup of whipping cream. You start with measuring a cup of whipping cream and you whip it, which will give you roughly two cups whipped. Now this cream was whipped very stiff. It was just thinking about becoming butter. So that's about where you want to go. Dot, don't go too far, but get it to the point where it just almost wants to become butter. So it's really stiff because you need the stiffness. Get one of your rubber scrapers. Drop it in the pumpkin. Now you're going to fold this into the pumpkin until it's well blended. And then of course you're going to set that whipped cream bowl aside and <clears throat> tend to it later. So folding is a matter of you go up one side and down the other, turn the bowl, and keep going around and around and around. So you're turning the bowl and you're going from top to bottom inside the bowl. You're not going sideways like this, or like this around the bowl. You're going from the bottom of the bowl, across the bottom, and across the top. That's what folding is. And then occasionally you'll go all the way around the edge like that to scrape down the sides. So you go over and around and around and around until you've got a pretty good mix where there's no streaks of either cream or a pumpkin. And that sometimes takes some time depending on what you're doing and how often you do this. But generally it goes pretty quickly and that way you don't lose any of your volume of your cream. And your cream here is, is the, the firmer part of the mixture. So you want to keep it fairly firm because you're going to have to you notice the ice cream took up a fair amount of room in that pie shell. You're going to have to pile this stuff, so it's going to need a little bit of substance to it. Okay. It's also, you can leave a few artistic streaks of pumpkin through that. I mean, it does look really nice. Okay, now we're going to go get our crust with our ice cream in it. Now this is a step where you can do this a little bit later on. Let that ice cream in the crust freeze right solid if you want before you get to that step. This is also a pie that can be made and should be made a day in advance, which takes away some of the stress of preparing that large holiday meal. So our ice cream, which is still pretty mucky, is in there. And we're going to put this pumpkin on top of it. And it's going to push the ice cream all over the place because it's not firm enough. But we'll persevere here. And the cauliflower is done too. Okay, fine. Well, we're going to turn that off. Tend to it the minute. Okay, so we've got basically here a combination of pumpkin and whipped cream, heavy on the cream. And underneath we have butter pecan ice cream. So you're looking at your crust, which we have the ingredients for. Two cups or one pint of butter pecan ice cream stirred until smooth. One cup of pumpkin, plain pumpkin, not pumpkin pie filling because you're adding the spices yourself. We had a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, quarter teaspoon of nutmeg, quarter teaspoon of, what was the other one, ginger? And there was a cup of sugar in there. And then we folded in the cream. Now something that's nice, just to decorate that, you can leave it right there. I mean, if you want to, you can leave it right there. Or you can take a cookie and you can mush it up. And you can sprinkle that all over the top which is kind of attractive and really mucks up the counter when you miss and you eat the big ones. Then you put this back in the freezer and freeze it firm. 
and it looks like this. And that's the pie that we'll finish. Now, you can make this a day in advance, just leave it in your freezer, fine. You can make this a week in advance. You can make this now for Thanksgiving if you want, but if you do that, wrap it tightly in foil so that the moisture stays in it so it doesn't dry out while it's in the freezer. But it is a frozen dish, and so therefore it can be made well in advance if you, if you find that more convenient for your holiday plants. And I have cookie crumbs all over my hands. Okay, not anymore. All right, now the cauliflower, which we hope is tender and Italian. Yeah, that's about right. Okay, now something you can do if you want, we probably should do it, but we're not going to at this point, but you can turn that heat up a little bit once it cooks and boil that liquid down. So make the, make the tomato liquid that's in there a little bit thicker than what this is, but we're not gonna take the time to do that now. So to serve that, we bring this over here and we look for a serving bowl, which is down here. And just to be fairly couth about this and not make too much of a mess, we use a spoon. Pull your cauliflower out. Like I say, what you're doing here is you're basically boiling cauliflower, which is not a great problem. And it uh, makes a far more interesting dish than plain cauliflower, and it's a different dish than cauliflower with cheese sauce, which is what you normally see. And like I say, you can see how, how much liquid is still in there from the tomatoes. Of course, with a 14 ounce can of tomatoes, you'll have less liquid. And like I say, you can always just boil that down a little bit, and it'll be a little bit thicker. So we'll pour that over there. Now, to finish that off, this is cauliflower italiano, of course. We're going to add a quarter of a cup of Parmesan cheese, which is, oh, maybe a handful and a half. So we'll just spread that over there like that. And that's a different way to serve cauliflower. That's not a big deal as far as preparation goes. So we have cauliflower italiano, which is, again, we'll go over the recipe if I can find it. We have a clove of garlic in there, which was sauteed in three tablespoons of oil, olive if you have it, just plain vegetable oil if you don't. If you don't have a clove of garlic in your kitchen, throw in some garlic salt, throw in some garlic powder, it doesn't matter. You have a 14 or 19 ounce can of tomatoes. Break those tomatoes up a little bit so you've got the, the little shreds here as opposed to the big tomatoes in there. And then we added to that a half a teaspoon of salt, quarter of a teaspoon of basil. We put it on the stove, we brought it to a boil. We chopped up our cauliflower, we chucked our cauliflower in on top, put a lid on it, cooked it for 10 minutes. And then we didn't reduce the liquid, but you can just by taking the lid off and turning up the heat. Put it in a bowl, put some cheese on it, and you're done. And then for dessert, you have the pie. And those are our two recipes for today, and the kitchen is a shambles, but I think we'll live. Um, for this recipe, if you want, if you lost track somewhere or you just want to, want to see it as a recipe, you can write Kootenai Kitchen. The address here is RR1 Site 33C28, and that's Castlegar. V as in Victor, 1, N as in Nancy, 3, H as in Herbert, 7. Send a self-addressed stamped envelope, please and we'll get you these recipes if you want them. And I'd like to thank Richard again down at Super Value for sponsoring this, and we'll see you next week. Kitchen was sponsored by Casagar Super Value. Super Value, where your satisfaction is our main concern.